Welcome everyone to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast. I'm a networking expert and the author of the upcoming book, No, No Strangers, How to Build Community, One Relationship at a Time. My why is the pursuit of mastery, and the goal of this podcast is to lock arms on a lifelong mission of daily personal growth to become the best version of ourselves. So let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. We are joined by a very special guest. She is the founder of Ottawa Rabbit Rescue. She's also also a veterinary technician student. So welcome to the podcast, Miss Megan Wright. Megan, how's it going? Good. How are you? I am very good. So you, you've had a busy morning already. You were in transit. Yes. Yes, I was. Yeah. So um, just... Um, you know, part of rescue, a big part of it is transporting rabbits from, from where they, they are and where they need to go next. Um, so that was what I was up to today. Mm, perfect. We made it, made it back just in time. I'm excited to talk to you uh, on this podcast. This is going to be very different from some of the other podcasts, but it's very, it's a very important topic. And um, I'd like to start by just kind of sharing how we got to where we are today, how you and I know each other, how we got to this podcast episode. So for me, this goes back, um, this goes back maybe a year. So I'm in Toronto and um, one of my friends, one of my friends is a foster uh, home for cats. So I didn't know this was a thing to me. It's just mm-hmm you own an animal or you don't. And, um, you know, every few times I'd go to this new friend's house, she'd have different cats and I'm wondering what's going on. And she tells me, well, you know what? Um, there's, there's a surplus of animals at different shelters. And, and if they can't find, um, anywhere for them to go, they, they have to put them down. So, um, you can actually be a foster home and you can take in dogs or cats or, or rabbits and you're essentially saving their life. You're buying them time for people to come in and adopt them and for them to find their forever home. So I thought that was pretty sweet. You know, if, if you'd like an animal, but maybe you're not ready to commit to, you know, 10 or 15 years having a pet, then maybe right. that's a good option and you're doing some good at the same time. So that was my, that planted the seed of, you know, that's possible to, to foster. So then uh, about seven or eight months ago, I moved to Ottawa and I'm thinking, okay, you know, I, I've got this space. I'm, I'm just living alone. I got lots of room here. Um, you know, maybe I could foster cats or, or dogs and, and do some good. And then yeah. in Ottawa, I meet somebody and she has a rabbit as a pet. And, you know, you probably get this a lot, but my idea of having a pet rabbit is like, you just have a rabbit in a little cage up on a dresser, you know, like a hamster or a gerbil or something. And this friend had this rabbit that just had free roam of the entire house, like two stories, um, it perfectly litter trained. It, it knows the sound of, you know, the fridge opening that that means food is here. It was super social, loved cuddles, would hop up on you. Very affectionate. Um, it has its own schedule. I mean, she had stairs up to her bed and this rabbit every night at 10 o'clock would make its way all the way upstairs, then up those little stairs onto the bed. Uh, she would lie down and sleep on this bed at a blanket at the end of the bed. And if the rabbit woke up before my friend, the rabbit would never go and wake up my friend. She'd wait. Once my friend woke up, she would go and get pet, uh, get some, you know, some pets and some cuddles. And I was just blown away by like the personality of these rabbits. And, and it opened my eyes to that. So then she, this is a long story. I'm almost done. So then she, um, gets me to follow these rabbit rescues on Instagram, like pumpkin acres and, uh, some other, I think it's just rabbit rescue. And then she said, Oh, there's one in Ottawa, Ottawa rabbit rescue. So I've been following these three every day. I'm getting these cute videos of, of these rabbits and then some sad videos of ones that have to be put down or ones that are injured and need rehabilitation. And then I decided, you know, maybe I'll be a, 
a foster and, and get some experience in. And we know how that turned out. I lasted about a week with Violet and decided to adopt her forever. So that's how we got mm-hmm. here. So let, let's get started with you of, of where did this love of, of animals come from? Because you have like a deep love and we're going to dive into how all the different ways I know that you have just a deep love for animals. I do. And honestly, I think it's just been a part of me for as long as I know, um, you know, since I was, you know, three, four, um, any dog walking down the street, I always wanted to stop and say hi and give it pets. And I was always asking for um, a family pet. Um, and uh, I think they're just, uh, as someone who is a little more, you know, shy and more of an introvert with people, um, animals have always just lent uh, a really big comfort to me as, as um, you know, a being that I can be with and feel accepted. Um, and, you know, they just have so much unconditional love to, to offer. Um, and there's so many, you know, great people in, in different and various animal communities. Um, you know, that's really where I've met a lot of my closest friends is through volunteering with rescues or through even my work. Um, and uh, it just, you know, they're, they're great things to be around no matter what the species is. <laughs> and, and when did you decide that you wanted to help rabbits uh, specifically? Um, so rabbits have uh, been an animal I've been interested in for a long time. Um, you know, and kind of same thing. I grew up with the the understanding that, like you said, you know, rabbits are something that are in a cage and, you know, are up on your dresser or, you know, they're not, you know, perhaps the most interesting pet to have. Um, but the more I started looking into them, the more I realized that they were a really interesting animal. And I did a ton of research for about six months, um, kind of thought that I really grasped what it would take to, to own a rabbit as well as, you know, the space they would need and uh, adopted my first one from um, a rescue. Uh, so he was three months old at the time. I'm not terribly sure of his history, if he was, you know, surrendered or if he, if he was found as a stray, um, but he was, you know, a cute little three month old rabbit I named Oakley. And, um, you know, with having him and still wanting to look into different resources uh, to uh, gain more knowledge about how I could be the best uh, rabbit owner, um, I very quickly started also seeing stories and posts kind of like you mentioned about injured rabbits and, you know, um, rabbits in need of foster homes or lots of sightings of of stray domestic rabbits just in my local neighborhood, um, you know, wandering the streets. And they're like a domestic cat or dog that, um, you know, they can't survive it, it out in the wild. We've domesticated them and kind of taken away their, their natural abilities to be able to survive. Um, and so that's really um, what led me to start wanting to help rabbits is realizing how popular of a pet they were, um, as well as, how much help they needed, especially in the Ottawa area. Um, at the time, there wasn't um, any rescues specifically dedicated to helping rabbits. And so it was really just the Ottawa Humane Society that was there to, to assist them when they were in need. So you, you started by like unofficially helping rabbits in any way that you could. And then yes. when did you first get the idea to make it official and start Ottawa Rabbit Rescue or, or start to, you know, foster or those kind of things? Um, so it would have been just over two years ago. Um, I have always uh, been involved with dog rescue. So I was doing some work fostering dogs at the time. And um, I had gained a little bit of an understanding about how a rescue and a nonprofit organization worked um, and kind of what it took to to run one. Um, and so that's when kind of the idea came about is I was surrounded by these people that had wonderful um, experience and knowledge with operating a nonprofit organization. And so I, I said, you know, what's something I can do to help? And um, that is what I thought I could bring to the table. Um, you know, I'm not able to open uh, an entire facility or a shelter, but I can, you know, start a small based rescue and, you know, whether whether it's one rabbit or, or five rabbits, um, I, I thought I could try and make a difference in that way. And 
I mean, this is how much you love animals is you and a friend when looking for a new place to live, you actually chose a place that has extra space or extra room so that you could take in these animals and essentially, right. essentially, you know, foster them until uh, a, a foster family or, or someone that would adopt them would come around. I mean, why, why was that important to you to kind of have, the, have that extra space to work with? Um, so it was important because that is both of our, our passions. It's what we, we enjoy doing. And, um, you know, for me in particular, uh, while I'm younger and I don't have kids yet, I, I'm very much of the mind that I want to do everything I can when I can. Um, so, you know, later down the road, I might not be able to take as many animals into my own home, depending on what my, my life situation is like. Um, but at the moment, I have the space, I have the time, um, as well as my work allows me to bring animals uh, or my pets into work with me. Um, so that's also an added bonus. Um, but uh, kind of you touched based on it earlier is that fostering really does save lives. And so, you know, a lot of people are, are hesitant to foster because they said, I, I can't, I couldn't do it. You know, I'll get too attached. And then I'd feel bad, you know, giving them away to their adoptive home. Um, but it truly is buying them time. Um, there are a lot of shelters, um, not in Ottawa, but, you know, in Canada, Ontario, Quebec, um, that when they reach, you know, certain levels, animals do have a deadline. And if they aren't adopted or transferred to a rescue, um, they are unfortunately euthanized through no fault of their own. Um, and so bringing an animal into your home for two or three months and, and giving them that extra time to find a forever family is, is, um, is really, you know, uh, the greatest thing you could do for them. And, and not just that you're, you know, saving their, their lives and buying them time, but, um, you know, we, we met up for coffee a few weeks ago, so I could pick your brain, you know, as a new <laughs> rabbit owner, uh, to pick your brain on everything to do with rabbits, which is how we got the idea to do this podcast so that everyone else can learn what I learned. Um, you had mentioned that, um, Fostering is also good because it it helps to kind of socialize the rabbits and and you know you're you're teaching them to to trust uh, humans and you're teaching them proper litter etiquette and and all those things. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So um, you know, in a shelter environment, it can be very much stressful for a rabbit, um, and you know they are provided with with excellent care. Um, however, it is kind of you know not the same care that you would get in a, in a home environment. Um, they're in kind of generally those smaller typical cages that you would think of uh, that you would buy from a pet store for a rabbit. Um, and, you know, they just don't have the time to dedicate to litter training and things like that. Um, so foster foster based rescue is really important because it really gives us an idea as to what a rabbit's true personality is. Um, it gives them time to kind of decompress if they're coming from a shelter environment. Um, you know, they, they can uh, bring their stress levels down and, and start to feel comfortable. And um, a lot of our, our foster volunteers are, are so critical in, in giving them kind of that extra boost and extra kind of gold stars to put on their, their adoption application that they are litter trained or, um, you know, they're able to tell their future adoptive family what their favorite toys are what their favorite veggies are. Um, and so they really just help uh, to make these rabbits more adoptable. So for all the, the rabbits you have available, you have these super in-depth bios. My, my family, I showed the bios and they were so impressed where it's like, you know, uh, this rabbit uh, loves this and this and, um, you know, they're, they're not great at that. And, and just a tip for this and, oh, they like snuggles or they don't like being picked up. And I guess that's comes from the a lot from the foster homes that get to know their exactly. their personalities okay okay why, why don't you give our listeners kind of a uh, an idea of what your house looks like for animals it's like a petting zoo up in there like you could you could open the door and charge people to come in you know christmas you could raise a lot of money i think with kids and animals yes. okay. um so our home uh is ever-changing with with animals um 
kind of our, I guess our core crew is, um, I have a dog of my own. Her name is Phoebe. She is almost a 10 year old Newfoundland. Um, is that inspired by Phoebe from friends or no? It's not, but it's a funny question because her personality is very, very much the same. And so it's, it's kind of funny how, how that worked out. Um, and then uh, I have a um, eight month old, I believe he's eight months old kitten named Fig. And uh, so he was kind of a, a recent addition to our home uh, over the summer months. Um, myself personally, I have three rabbits. So I mentioned my first rabbit uh, that I adopted, his name was Oakley and he is uh, married to his fun wife named Sophie. Um, so they're, they're bonded. That's the, that's the term for rabbits is bonded when there's two yes. of them. Yes. So they're bonded. Um, and then I have a, a solo rabbit. She was one of the rabbits that I helped, you know, early on in, in the rescue. And um, I guess you could use the term for myself, foster fail. Um, I, uh, I foster failed her and her name is Skittles. Um, so uh, so she, a foster fail is where it should be temporary, but then you just can't let them go and you end up adopting them. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, so she was, um, they're all special, but she was uh, a little bit more um, special to me personally. And so I, I kept her. Um, and then my roommate has uh, a dog just over about a year of age. His name is Ronan. Um, she has two cats, Loki and Scouse. And then uh, she also has a rabbit um, who uh, she adopted through the rescue. Um, and uh, her name is Lou. And um, from there, it really, really kind of depends on, on the day of the week or the month. Um, she is very heavily involved with the rescue uh, for dogs called Bullies in Need, um, which focuses on uh, bully breed dogs. Um, so at the moment, uh, we have, I believe, two dogs um, uh, in foster. We recently actually had a litter of eight puppies, however. So that was a, a first experience for both of us raising um, puppies from about four days old until they're old enough to go to their their forever homes um, and uh, in terms of rabbits right now uh, I have within the rescue um, three rabbits that I'm personally fostering for the rescue mm. so what would you say for Ottawa rabbit rescue what would you say is kind of the official thing that you do like is there like a, a statement of like here at Ottawa rabbit rescue we we facilitate the you know like what what would you say exactly are, are the, the 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 role of or the duties of Ottawa rabbit rescue so um our honestly our main goal is to educate um, I think, you know, there is a huge misconception as to what type of pet rabbits are. And I think, you know, for us to make any difference, um, it, it really needs to be uh, to, to educate the public and to just gain a better understanding of, of what it takes to own a rabbit as a, as a pet, um, how much time that, that they, you know, they require as well as funds. Um, so that would be kind of our, our first uh, goal in our mission. Um, the, the second is to, to assist rabbits in need. So we do uh, primarily focus on trying to assist rabbits that are either found outside as strays or are running out of time in shelters. Um, there is a different kind of method that you can take rabbits in via rescue, which would be an owner surrender. So that's coming from a situation where they are already in a home and for whatever reason, they're not able to care for the rabbit any longer. Um, that those rabbits are in need, um, but of course, a rabbit on the street is is slightly more um, at risk and in danger. And so, those are the ones that we we do strive to to um, help out first whenever we can. Mm. Well, that's what we're doing today, right? Is educating and raising awareness, and and we'll see what what good can come out of this uh, this conversation, which is awesome. So. Yes. Why, why do you think that it's dogs and cats that get all the attention? So people know that there's, there's humane societies, there's, there's rescues for dogs and cats. You see, you know, commercials and, and, you know, when I first moved here, I went out for a walk and there was a sign to, to foster or adopt cats and dogs. It's like, it's like they have the attention, they have the funding, 
Um, mm-hmm. why, why do you think it is that the focus is on dogs and cats and rabbits kind of get, you know, a little less of the love? Um, I, I think, uh, again, it comes from education and, and just knowledge of, of the general public about what um, a rabbit can be for you as a pet. Um, so cats and dogs are seen, you know, as animals that are the perfect companion. They can give you unconditional love. They're interactive with you. Um, you know, a lot of people can kind of, uh, transfer human uh, emotions or qualities onto them. And, and people don't think of rabbits as that they think, you know, that they're just there, um, that they, you know, probably just eat and sleep. Um, you know, they might have seen them before in petting zoos, um, things like that. And they don't see them as intelligent, emotional animals. Um, and I think that is really why they're kind of skipped over. Um, and, you know, as, as you've come to learn, they're, they're fantastic animals. Um, they have huge personalities. They all have individual personalities. Um, they, you know, will very much tell you what they like and don't like. They can learn tricks. Um, they can, you know, learn to be uh, called by their name. Um, and um, they, you know, they really are a, a really great family, family pet. So rabbits aren't vocal, you know, like a a cat barks, a dog meows. Uh, Rabbits are essentially silent, which is good for me with the recording I do, whether it's for music or podcasts or whatever. So it's, it's like, you know, Violet's right there and you're not going to hear a sound, which is, which is perfect. Um, So they, they communicate in other ways. So if they're angry, they do the thump, which is where, you know, thumper comes from. Everyone knows a cartoon rabbit. Um, in what ways do, do they, do they communicate? So you could talk about the thump or other things that they do. Yeah. So they have a a wide range of ways that they communicate with us. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, the thump is kind of one of the more, um, classic ones that a lot of people may know of. And they, as you said, use that to communicate when they're either upset um, or even to um, to communicate when they sense danger. Uh, so there actually have been stories of, of people where, you know, they've been woken up in the middle of the night because of the rabbit thumping and they've woken up to, you know, a fire in their home or, or things like that. Um, they uh, will also, um, if they are upset with you or, or displeased with something, um, they are able to make kind of small grunts. Um, so, you know, if you're rearranging their blankets in a way that they don't like, um, or if they're feeling threatened in any way. So, um, you know, if you're putting your hands kind of in um, to pet them and they're, they're not in the mood, they can communicate that way. Um, they also uh, do communicate um, when they're happy. Um, rabbits actually purr. And so- But it it's is, not like a cat's purr, it's right. different. It's, um, their, their teeth actually will chatter together. Um, and um, it can be quite loud, um, but that is, uh, you know, when they're really happy. So if they're just kind of flopped out, um, relaxing, or if you're petting them and they're in a really, you know, pleasant, relaxed, happy state, you can often hear them purring. Um, and uh, the sign of a truly happy, relaxed bunny is when they are, you know, flopped out on their side, which your girl Violet is <laughs> so great at doing. Um, and, uh, you know, that is because they are a, a prey animal. Um, that's kind of showing that they are extremely comfortable and feeling very safe in their environment. Um, so you can really tell a lot by their body language as well. Mm, so the thump is like you mentioned, a lot of times it's if they're scared, it can be if they're disoriented, if they're confused. Um, so Violet woke me up one time thumping. And it's because that day during the day I had rearranged. So she's, she's scared of hardwood floors for some reason. Like, I don't know if there's like something in her past where something happened on a hardwood floor, but I had to go out and buy all these mats. I'm all hardwood floor in in my place. So I had to build a tunnel of mats for her to go where she wants. And I had actually moved the mats around a bit. I had rearranged. So then at nighttime, it's, you know, quite a bit darker and her space has been rearranged just a few 
hours earlier. So I think she was kind of scared and disoriented. So yeah. it's like, they don't do it for no reason. It's, it's they're right. communicating to you. So, you know, you go out and you kind of pet them and calm them down and turn the lights on a bit. And, and it's, you diffuse the situation, but that's my experience with the thumb. Yeah. And then the ultimate sign of pleasure is the illustrious binky. Can you talk about what a binky is? Where does that term come from? Any idea? <laughs> yes. I, I forgot to mention the binky. Um, so I, you know, I truly don't know where that term came from. I think, you know, it's probably one of those great things where someone came up with it one day and it stuck. Um, so uh, a binky is basically when rabbits uh, are jumping for joy. Um, so, you know, kind of like uh, puppies, they can get zoomies sometimes and they'll, you know, zoom around the room when they're when they're happy and, and feeling playful. And, um, you know, they'll jump up in the air and and kick out their back legs and shake their head. And, and that's them, again, feeling really, really comfortable and, and confident uh, where, where they are and, and is them uh, kind of playing, really. Um, but, uh, yeah, it is a funny word. And um, it is something that is, you know, much loved in the rabbit community. Um, if you, you ever have videos of Violet binking, please record them and send them to us and post on, you know, the Facebook group because everyone always adores seeing those. Yeah, it's it it seems to me like it's like an involuntary jump for joy. It's like it looks like they just cannot control themselves. It's like the Holy Spirit comes over them <laughs> and and they it's it's like they suddenly find themselves in the air. Like they don't know how they got there and they're they just kind of twist and land. Like it's like they they jump and they don't know where they're gonna land. It's like the yeah. weirdest, like contorted uh, involuntary motion, but it just, it's, it's like if there was pure joy captured in a movement, it's that, you know? Exactly. Exactly. They, they really show when they're truly happy and it, it is adorable. Yeah. It makes me pretty happy when, uh, when I see her do it. So <laughs> she actually does it almost on cue now. So, um, we'll talk about what they eat in their diet. Uh, a part of that is, you know, the, the rabbit, pellets, the little pellet mm -hmm. food. So she has these five cups that you can stack with a few pellets in each. So she has to figure out how to take the cups apart and flip them over and all that. But whenever she hears the cups and she knows pellets are coming, she takes off into the living room, runs around, does a binky and comes back in time to <laughs> get them. It's like on cue now. It's, it's like the sound triggers the binky, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Those are the the cups you mentioned. Stacking cups are a well loved toy uh, with rabbits. Um, I don't know what it is with them, but they they love puzzles and knocking things over. And so I think it's it's the perfect uh, combination. And uh, I'm not surprised that she has made those her favorite. <laughs> So I see videos of rabbits playing with all kinds of toys, you know, balls and things of hay and whatever. Violet doesn't really play with any toys unless there's food in them. So it's like the cups. If there's just the cups, she won't do anything. It's like the cups are in the way of getting the food. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, she has something else that she won't play with. But if I put a few pellets in it, and she kind of has to play with it and move it for the pellets to fall back out. She'll play. So it has to be, you know, food inspired to play with the, and, and maybe that's with us too. We, you know, we're all the, you know, we're looking, we're just looking for food too. But um, is that, is that normal? Like do most rabbits just play with toys and it keeps them entertained or do they need, need some kind of food, uh, you know, to get them going? Um, I would say it can really depend on the individual. Um, so kind of like, you know, dogs and cats, uh, they, they are interested in, in different toys. Um, so, you know, some animals are more food motivated, which may be in Violet's case. Um, that probably leads back to the fact that rabbits are foraging animals. Um, so, you know, out in the wild, they need to kind of roam and, you know, search under things and, and look for their food. And so that's probably where that um, kind of instinct is coming in. Um, you know, some rabbits are, are more curious. They are more willing to kind of pick up and, and try new things, um, even if there's not food there, just to see what something does. Um, but they, they really do have um, 
a big need for daily enrichment um, to keep them mentally stimulated. Um, they they need to you know explore or or have puzzles or toys to play with. Um, a lot of the times when you have a rabbit owner that you know may say that they're struggling with destructive behaviors, you know maybe they're digging at carpets or chewing on baseboards, things like that. Um, a lot of the time when you kind of look into the situation, it, it can stem back to them not having enough for them to do they're bored and so they're they're kind of turning you know to these areas that we we don't want them to to dig at or chew at um but it's just because they're not being provided with with enough um toys or or puzzles to enrich them so i actually just finished reading the adventures of alice in wonderland today and it's the first time i read that story surprisingly <laughs> And what's cool is that book popularized the term going down the rabbit hole and rabbits actually dig holes. And what's cool is I've heard that their thump where, you know, they're thumping because they're scared or there's danger or whatever, that a part of that is because they dig holes and, you know, a lot of them are underground that if one is up top, and there's danger, it thumps and the vibration actually sends the message to the other rabbits down the rabbit hole. So I thought that mm -hmm. was kind of a cool a way of communication, you know? Yeah, that's super cool. And so the thump, so rabbits don't have a mechanism to defend themselves. Like other animals, like a porcupine has you know, the, the, the quills, a, a skunk has the smell, cats and dogs have, have the teeth or the claws. Uh, with rabbits, it's sad, but each individual rabbit is just kind of this prey that gets attacked by everything and gets eaten and can't really defend itself. But rabbits as a species as a whole, their mechanism of defense is that they reproduce so quickly that they can reproduce and populate more than the ones that are getting killed as an individual. So, you know, three individuals can't defend themselves and get killed and then 10 more are born. And that's how the species as a whole protects itself. So it's kind of sad as, as on an individual level, but I wanted you to talk about, you mentioned to me just how fast they can get pregnant and give birth. Like this is not a nine month process. This happens quickly and they can give birth to quite a bit of rabbits. Can you, right. can you talk about that uh, a little bit? Cause I, I, I thought that was fascinating. I, I sure. had no idea. Um, so yes, uh, rabbits um, are highly reproductive and um, can reproduce uh, quite quickly. Uh, so the gestation period for a rabbit is on average uh, 30 days, so about a month. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, litter sizes can, can vary greatly. Um, it could be anywhere from uh, one to 12 uh, per litter. Um, baby rabbits are called kits. Uh, so, you know, it only takes 30 days for let's say 12 rabbits to be born. And then the mother uh, rabbit can actually become pregnant again um, within even a day of giving birth. Um, so, yeah, so you could, you could have, you could have just two rabbits and then just those two rabbits could produce over 120 rabbits in a year, let alone what all their babies are doing. That's crazy. Exactly. Exactly. So um, rabbits uh, and the young become uh, sexually reproductive quite early. Um, so, you know, generally speaking, around 12 weeks of age is when a rabbit um, could likely start reproducing. Um, myself personally in the rescue, I don't take any risks past about five or six weeks old. Um, so if I have any uh, young litters or babies in the rescue um, past, you know, um, the five or six week mark, I do separate them based on gender, um, just based on the fact that they can um, reproduce uh, so young, I don't want to put any uh, risks in there and, and you know, um, 
create any more any more rabbits for the the overpopulation that we're seeing. Um, but uh, yes, it can um, become quite out of control quite quickly. And um, it is something that we we do see uh, in rescue is um, you know people having rabbits where either um, they didn't realize how easily they could reproduce or they actually didn't they realize they that the two that they, they had, they have two exactly. Yeah. Um, they are notoriously hard to, to identify um, by sex. And so that happens a lot. And we have a lot of people reaching out to us when they have, you know, accidental litters and then they have one accidental litter. And before they know it, they, they have two or three before they, they realize how quickly that could happen again. Um, so it is um, quite different, um, you know, compared to some other species. So I guess a part of the issue is number one, the lack of awareness for rabbits versus cats and dogs. And number two is just the crazy speed of, of reproduction. Um, so there's just this surplus and it keeps compounding and compounding. Um, you mentioned to me that almost on a daily basis, you get um, messages of, of more rabbits that need help. I mean, how, like, how dire is this situation? Like how, how many rabbits are you seeing that, that just need help? Um, honestly, we're in, in quite a, a dire situation and I, I don't even think that is, you know, Ottawa based. I think, um, that is quite widespread. Um, on a daily basis, I'm I'm receiving anywhere between five to ten messages um, of people requesting assistance, and that's you know, uh, you know, owner surrenders or sightings of of stray rabbits seen in the area, um, to you know, again, uh, rabbits that are reaching the end of their their timeline in, in local shelters. Um, the majority of shelters in Ontario that I know of are actually at capacity for rabbits. So they themselves, you know, these big, big places you think of like Ottawa Humane Society, um, other humane societies and shelters that you think, you know, would ha have infinite resources, um, they're at capacity and they're not able to take in, you know, any, any further animals as well. And, you know, it, we're looking at, um, you know, six to eight week timelines for them to be able to take in, in a rabbit just based on the numbers that they have. Um, there's been actually a few articles that have come out recently um, discussing this problem and uh, kind of linking it to this pandemic of, of overpopulation of pets from, from COVID that we've been um, kind of worried about. And I feel like rabbits may be kind of the first sign of that, that we're seeing um, that, uh, that there's just, there's nowhere for them to go. Mm. So before anyone adopts or fosters a rabbit, at least from you, the rabbits go to the vet, they get a, a full check up to see what's going on and they get spayed or neutered so that there aren't any problems with the reproduction. Um, what, what does that vet bill look like? And we're going to talk about, you know, the need for, for funding and, and, and fundraisers and volunteers and all that stuff. So what is, what does that look like? Right. So um, the average cost, I'll, I'll kind of give you the, the total first, and then I'll break it down a little bit. Um, the average cost for a healthy rabbit to come through rescue that has not already been spayed or neutered um, would be about $1,000 from the time we take them in to the time we adopt them out. Um, you know, so that vet bill we're looking at, their initial health exam is uh, approximately $130. Um, the reason why this is a little bit higher than perhaps uh, the exam fee people would be used to paying for their dog or cat is that rabbits are actually considered an exotic pet. Um, so there are not uh, a lot of vets in the area that uh, are willing to see rabbits based on the fact that they're just not part of their, their standardized schooling when they go through school. Um, so they, you know, they all learn a little bit about rabbits, um, but only those that are actually interested in seeing exotic animals um, go on to learn um, more about the species and learn, you know, more in depth about how to properly um, provide them with, with good medicine. Um, so your cost is already 
has already gone up there for the expertise of not only the, the veterinarian on staff, but as well as all of the, the technicians, which are equivalent to human nurses, as well as the support staff that need to have the experience to, to answer your questions and to, to work around these animals. Um, and you, you had mentioned to me when we met up that uh, even the anesthesia is different, right? Yes, yes. Um, so again, they are, uh, you know, a different um, uh, species in comparison to dogs or cats. So they are uh, sensitive to, to different drugs that we would normally use for surgery. So they require different anesthetic types um, because they are smaller, um, even to, to intubate them. So that's when you would put the breathing tube down their throat for surgeries um, is, is a lot more uh, complicated and requires more equipment than a dog or cat uh, spay or neuter would. Um, and so there your costs are kind of going up. Um, and, and again, it really is just the quality of, of medicine that, that you're paying for, which is why, um, you know, I'm going to say you could probably find someone out there that, that may do it cheaper. Um, but you're paying for the knowledge and for the, you know, the, the risk level to go down, um, when you're paying for the care of, of your rabbit. And so that's why, um, we do use clinics that specialize in exotics for the safety of our rabbits and to ensure that they are being provided with proper care. And are there a few, a few in Ottawa that you would recommend? For, yes. Uh, vet, um, vet so clinics? Uh, Linwood Animal Hospital in uh, the Bells Corners area is um, kind of the exotic destination that I would I would highly recommend. I use them for my personal rabbits, so I use them and had a relationship with them, um, you know, before rescue even uh, kind of took place. Um, and now uh, they are who we use. Um, they are absolutely fantastic. All of their staff are, are highly trained um, in exotics and they have all of the proper equipment um, that they, they need to use to give the rabbits proper care. Um, I have heard of clients traveling from as far as Toronto to come and see this clinic um, because they are just so fantastic. Um, in terms of emergency care services, uh, there are a couple 24-hour clinics um, in Ottawa that provide emergency care similar to a human emergency department. Um, however, there's actually only one in Ottawa that will see exotics, um, which is the um, Ottawa Animal Emergency and Specialty Hospital in the Saint Laurent area. Um, so if it's after hours and, you know, Linwood or whatever regular clinic you may be using is closed or on the weekend, um, that is the place to go. Um, and that is actually the only place to go for emergency care um, between uh, here in Toronto and here in Montreal. I think Violet will like to know that she's considered an exotic animal. I think <laughs> yes. that's, that's, that's pretty sweet. So if I'm doing the math correctly... It, it costs about $1,000 for a rabbit to go through Ottawa Rabbit Rescue and get adopted. The adoption fee is only $140. So uh, I'm not great at math, but there's a huge gap in the expenses versus the, the income coming in. So how how can can people help the cause so they can help by you know fostering or by adopting that helps the rabbits to help auto a rabbit rescue how can how can people help out is it is it um donating and providing funds is it helping with fundraising is it volunteering to help out in any way possible is it as a driver for pickups and drop-offs what what can the good people listening to this podcast do if they're inspired by uh, your message here today? Honestly, there is probably something for everyone. We welcome um, all volunteers, whatever you can do. We are so thankful. Um, I've come to know so many fantastic people that I would now consider close friends and family through rescue and the giving nature of, of people and what they're willing to do is absolutely incredible. Um, the biggest thing, as you mentioned, I think is definitely funding. Um, rescues aren't around to make money. They never will. Um, if they are making money, I think there's something wrong. <laughs> um, so 
the, the biggest need that we have is, is raising funds for medical expenses. Um, so, you know, whether that's participating in our online fundraisers, we do run online auctions um, or coming up with, um, you know, a fundraising idea of your own. Um, we're always happy to, to receive ideas if you ever want to reach out to us um, and kind of pitch us your idea. Um, we'd be happy to work with, with you uh, to make something happen as well. Um, as well as uh, donating much needed items. So when we do receive monetary donations, we like to put them towards medical care. Um, you know, that is generally our biggest expense. That is where we have outstanding bills. And, you know, uh, if we have enough food and supplies and bedding donated to us physically, so we don't have to spend our funds on that, um, that allows us to, to pay down those, those veterinary bills uh, more easily. Um, you also mentioned, you know, can we can we help drive to appointments, uh, things like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so because we are a small rescue, it um, you know it actually is just me right now, um, kind of coordinating it and running everything. Uh, and so uh, I do need to work, and um, there are days where you know a rabbit may have an appointment or you know, they need to get from their foster home to a possible forever family on the other side of the city, and even those contributions even if it's only a 20 minute drive is is a huge help because I can't be everywhere at once um, and you know our, our foster families and other volunteers are already doing so much that um, you know they need they need extra help as well and so um, really we're we're always open to any suggestions that that anyone may have um, and uh, kind of down the road in the future um, we also hope to be able to maybe find another partner to to be able to to, to come on as um, a member of, of board of directors or, or someone that might be interested in helping run a nonprofit organization so that we can continue to expand. So where, where can people go online to, to find you? So I know you're on Instagram and I know you're on Facebook of Ottawa Rabbit Rescue. Is it just at Ottawa Rabbit Rescue on both of those? It is, yes. So uh, Instagram and Facebook is at Ottawa Rabbit Rescue. Um, our uh, email is Ottawa Rabbit Rescue at gmail.com. And uh, we are currently in the process of launching our online website. Um, so that hopefully will be up and running in the coming months. It is something that I am um, trying to get, get put together in, in my downtime. And um, once that is up, Um, see and keep track of the rabbits that we have um, for adoption or currently in our care. Awesome. And um, would you would you recommend with with the amount of rabbits that that need homes here? Would you always recommend that a new potential rabbit owner adopt versus going to a pet store or going to a breeder where they're they're compounding the problem by breeding more when there's already too many and make doing it for a profit. Yes. Um, so, you know, there, there is kind of the slogan adopt, don't shop. And I think that is something that, that we take under our wing as, as a slogan here at, at Ottawa Rabbit Rescue. Um, there are so many rabbits in need, in need of homes um, and so many rabbits that don't have a, a spot to go. We don't need to add any more to the population. Um, when you go through a rescue, whether it's us or if you're not in, in the Ottawa area, you know, there's so many other reputable rabbit rescues out there. Um, you are getting, uh, you know, almost a, a guarantee of, of what kind of rabbit you're bringing into the home. So as you mentioned, you know, we have lengthy bios, we know exactly what the rabbit's personality is like, what home they would do best in. Um, and you're also getting, you know, per se, a bang for your buck. So you're paying an adoption fee um, to, to assist the rescue, um, but it is nowhere near the cost that you would pay if you are, are purchasing a rabbit from, you know, Kijiji or, or a breeder and needing to go through all of those steps of, of bringing them to um, uh, a veterinary clinic 
clinic and having them spayed or, spayed or neutered, that's already covered for you. Um, so it, it honestly is uh, a bit of a savings for, for a new owner when they bring a rabbit into their home initially. Um, and uh, I think it's really important to set up uh, yourself for success. And so, um, you know, you wouldn't bring a dog into your home knowing nothing about it, knowing if, you know, it would get along well with your, your kids or your other, other animals in your home. And, and the same thing should be for a rabbit. Um, a rabbit should not be an impulse buy for, you know, $20 off an, on online ad. It should be, um, you know, thought out um, and, and considered as, as a commitment for the duration of their life, which can be, you know, from close to 10 to 12 years. Hmm. Okay. 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 So if, if our listeners decide to submit an application to foster or adopt, um, what are the kind of things that you're looking for that would get that application approved and, and maybe what are the red flags? Sure. So, um, definite red flags are, uh, wanting a rabbit as a gift for someone, um, animals are not gifts, they're living beings. And again, they are a lifetime commitment. So it needs to be a mutual decision between whether it's, you know, um, yourself and a partner or your friend that you're wanting to get a rabbit for, or the whole family, it, it needs to be a thought out collective decision. Um, they are not something to put under the Christmas tree uh, in a few weeks. Um, and uh, that is definitely something that, you know, is, is a huge red flag for us. Um, one of the other red flags that we often see is, is wanting to get uh, rabbits as a pet for a young child. Um, so because they are fragile, <laughs> um, you know, they, they tend to not like being picked up. They are prey species, so they can be more nervous um, around sudden movements. And some rabbits, you know, are, are not the most affectionate per se in terms of wanting a lot of, of hands-on pets, um, pets and cuddles. Um, they're not great great pets for young children that, you know, maybe want that really hands-on experience and, and might be a little rough. Um, so that is something where, you know, if someone's reaching out and they, they're saying, I want a pet, um, you know, for my child, they're asking for it, but the family as a whole isn't actually interested in, in um, participating in the rabbit's care or, or have made it a collective decision. Um, that again is something that um, would be a red flag. Um, what we do look for is, you know, for people who have done their research. Um, so I am so open to people who are interested in learning. Maybe they don't know everything about rabbit care. Um, they've just started exploring and they're reaching out, you know, wanting to know what the process looks like um, or, you know, exactly what we recommend um, to have in place for a proper care of a rabbit in the home. Um, that's, that's the best thing you can do is just to ask questions and, and being open to learn. Um, so you don't need to, you know, have an encyclopedia of rabbit knowledge, um, you know, at, at your fingertips to have to, to be able to apply with us. Um, but having an idea of what it takes and, and having an understanding that, you know, a rabbit is not a, a pet that is to be placed on top of your dresser in a small cage and left in there all day. Um, you know, um, having a sense of the cost that, that it will take and being willing to take your rabbit to annual veterinary checkups, um, you know, being willing to pay the couple hundred dollar bill it could, it could cost if your rabbit is sick and needs to go to the vet. Um, all of those things are, are really important um, to us. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's, it's silly to say, but sometimes there's just also a feeling that you get when you receive an application and um, you're, you just can tell that, you know, a person or a family is, is uh, really genuinely interested in, in helping a rabbit in need and um, that they can be worked with and um, you know, uh, discussions can be had and education can be given to, to be able to um, get them set up to bring a rabbit into their home. So over the last six weeks that I've had Violet, I've been going down the rabbit hole on YouTube, watching like cute rabbit videos, educational, all those things. I came across a video that was the 10 signs that your rabbit loves you. Um, can you share 
uh, some of the signs that uh, a rabbit might do that shows that they're they're enjoying your company and that they they love you and that they're comfortable. You've shared a few before, but just if you can rattle off the top of your head all the different ways in in which a rabbit um, you know might show you that it loves you. Sure, I'll, I'll try, and then you can let me know if I've forgotten any. Okay. Um, so, uh, as mentioned before, binking is definitely one of the top signs that your rabbit is is happy and loves you. Um, them even just being close uh, in proximity to you, um, wanting to sit near you, to to flop out and lay near you. Um, the purring that we mentioned before, you know, they're, they're happy in your presence. They like your attention, um, seeking uh, physical affection from you. So um, when a rabbit wants to be pet, they will kind of lower their head um, almost as a, an invitation uh, for you to, to give them physical affection. Um, some rabbits also uh, do give kisses per se. So, um, you know, they will in, in, um, in the wild mutually groom each other or bonded pair as well. And so some people do experience their, their rabbits actually uh, licking them and giving them uh, little kisses as well. Um, but really it, like there's, there's a lot more and I'm sure maybe you can remind me from, from that video as well. Um, but the biggest thing is if they're kind of wanting to be in your space and follow you around and be with you, um, all of those, all of those things kind of mixed in between are, are what shows that a rabbit is, is in love with you and, and, um, is a happy pet. Yeah. So after, after, a, a week or two, I saw that video and out of the 10 things, there's only two that she wasn't doing. So I'm like, okay, eight out of 10 is pretty good. Like she's probably yeah. happy. Um, she, she hadn't binkied yet and she doesn't kiss, do the kisses, which is licking. Um, so since then she's, she's on the binky train. She's good, but she still doesn't <laughs> kiss. So I don't know. I don't know what that is. Some rabbits do some rabbits don't. Exactly. The closest we get is if I have some kind of food, like if I gave her like a blueberry and there's like a little blueberry juice it's like, there's a reason why she's licking my finger. It's not, it's not a kiss. It's to get the rest of that blueberry, but, but <laughs> right. you know, um, so what, what kind of space does, does a rabbit need? So again, a lot of people have the misconception that it's just, if it fits in a cage, then the cage is good, but there's like a minimum recommendation. And even the minimum recommendation is a pretty small space. So what is, what is the minimum and then what would be ideal and why do they need space? Sure. Um, so kind of the minimum space is generally uh, known as 12 square feet um, or kind of like a four by four foot pen. Um, that uh, is seen at minimum uh, because, you know, rabbits need space to move around and, and stretch their legs like we do. Um, you know, if they're cooped up in a cage all day, they can't uh, get the proper exercise that they need. They can't comfortably, you know, stretch out or even have, you know, appropriate separate areas, you know, a, a, an area that they can sleep in that's clean as well as an area for their, their litter box. Um, so in terms of when you're thinking about what kind of space do I need in my home if I if I want to bring a rabbit in, um, it, it can really vary. Um, you know, at minimum, you're going to need some sort of pen um, or enclosure uh, that you can set up in a room in your home. Um, a lot of people uh, use kind of exercise pens. So there are those pens that you see um, like dogs or, or puppies kept in. Um, that's what we primarily use for a lot of our foster rabbits as well as a, a home base per se. Um, so that can take up actually quite a bit of space. It's, it's a lot bigger than, you know, those those small cages that are sold in pet stores. Um, from there, uh, it can it can only grow. Uh, so you know, some people are able to dedicate entire uh, spare bedrooms to rabbits, which is absolutely fantastic. And you know, they may just put a gate up in, in the doorway if they want to be able to kind of restrict access to certain areas of their home, um, or when they're not able to be supervised. And um, a lot of rabbits, which is really surprising to a lot of people, are free roam. Um, so they have access to around the home just like a dog or cat would um, you know they have 
maybe their area where they have their bed and their litter box. Um, but they're just as big a part um, of the family as anyone else. And they, uh, like Violet, uh, you know, wanders around. Um, you know, maybe they can hop up on the couch and watch TV uh, or hop in bed. Um, my little girl Skittles uh, sleeps in bed with me her, my dog and my cat all climb up on the couch with me to watch movies. Um, so they, they really uh, do well, um, kind of with large amounts of space. And again, it leads, it leads back to the fact that they are not um, kind of these, you know, stupid, thoughtless pets that a lot of people I think think they are um they need uh exercise and they need mental stimulation and they need a lot of uh interaction and, and affection they really do seek that out and the interaction that can either come from an owner that loves them and spends time with them or it can come from a, another rabbit if they're they're bonded absolutely and, and some, some rabbits, like in Violet's case, um, she doesn't play well with other rabbits. And maybe that's from the hoarding situation where it's like survival of the fittest. There's not enough food for all the rabbits that have been abandoned. And that's why she survived. Um, and, you know, she's got a good situation now. And if you put another rabbit into it, it's like, wait, that rabbit might take everything I have. And, you know, who knows what's going on there. But um, some rabbits play well and can be bonded and some can't, that's just the way it is. Uh, yes. So rabbits are very territorial. Um, so, um, uh, they, they do like to keep their space as theirs. Um, a lot of rabbits perhaps can be bonded to another rabbit. However, it can't just be any rabbit. They are very selective. Um, can't really tell you what makes them choose one over the other. Again, it is very individual. And so um, that is also something to consider if you already have a rabbit and you're thinking about getting a second one is that this second rabbit that you bring into the home, um, you know, they might actually not get along. And so you either need to be prepared to be able to have the space to care for two rabbits separately if it ends up that they don't form a relationship. Um, or uh, like we offer at, at the rabbit rescue is um, trial adoption. So if someone has a rabbit and they're looking to bond, um, you know, we can do our best to to select a rabbit that we think will of course fit in with the family first um but may also get along with their existing rabbit and um they kind of you know go through a process and, and it can take months or even years actually for for rabbits to become bonded to each other it's quite um uh, an in-depth process and um you know we have had families where we've tried two or three rabbits before um we found one that you know is a perfect match and it's kind of like people it really is like dating and um <laughs> they uh they don't want to be just with anyone they they need to find um a partner that, <laughs> that and is, they don't uh, just settle they have high standards no, they don't and um yeah they they need to date and they, they need to pick who they, who they want to be bonded with. So um, it, it can be uh, quite funny that way, actually. And a rabbit's diet. I mean, cartoons have us believe that they just eat carrots, but that's not true, right? No. Um, so uh, carrots uh, should be mainly just as occasional treats for rabbits. Um, their main source um, of food actually uh, for domesticated rabbits is hay. Um, so they can eat a lot of hay and they should always have unlimited access to that during the day. So that would be about, you know, 80% of, of their diet. Um, there are also, you know, commercially made available rabbit pellets, um, which again, because we've domesticated animals and, um, you know, we need to find ways to feed them in our home. That's kind of become also a, a main staple of a rabbit's diet. Um, however, it should definitely not be the main source um, because rabbit's teeth continuously grow. That's also part of the reason why they need to eat things like hay um, to uh, constantly have that chewing and grinding action to keep their teeth uh, worn down naturally. Um, if they are fed an improper diet, that's oftentimes where you start to see dental issues creeping in. Um, and sometimes that can require veterinary intervention. Um, so uh, we have hay as our main source. Um, 
uh, rabbit pellets, you know, can be given in small quantities once or twice a day um, and, and also can be used as, as treats. Um, like you said with violet, a lot of rabbits do go crazy over them because they are quite tasty and often what those are is just, um, you know, compressed uh, hay as well, essentially. Um, and then uh, we have our daily uh, leafy greens and, and vegetables, um, which are also really important for rabbits um, to get, um, you know, uh, their daily intake of fiber as well as the other nutrients and vitamins that they need. Um, so the dark green veggies, um, like the, the kale and the romaine lettuce, that is um, what's important for rabbits to have when you're looking at things like carrots, um, for example, or um, apples, bananas, um, you know, berries, those are all really high in sugar. So those should be reserved for, for treats as well um, and can kind of be equivalented to, to candy in a rabbit sense. Mm. And their, their sleep schedule is very different. They don't have the same schedule that we have, right? Right. Um, so rabbits are uh, corpuscular animals. That's a good so word, they, corpuscular. They, how about corpuscular. that? Hashtag corpuscular. Okay. Yes. Don't ask me how to spell it. Um, but uh, so they are most active at dawn and dusk. Um, so, you know, you may often, um, see rabbits, uh, will sleep a lot during the day. Um, you know, early in the morning, they'll be active. They might, uh, hang out with you, have their breakfast, have playtime, and then kind of those key hours when you're awake or maybe working from home, um, is kind of when they're, they're vegging out, uh, they nap a lot. Um, they might kind of, you know, retreat and have have their own time. And, um, you know, after the dinner hour is, is when they, uh, tend to become active again in the evening. Um, some of them are more active than others kind of during the overnight period. Um, but, uh, definitely kind of during those early morning hours and in, in the later evening is, is when they like to, to come out to play the most. The first few days with Violet, where I'm getting to know her and her personality it so I didn't know the sleep schedule so I didn't know that they actually sleep kind of in the middle of the day um so it kind of broke my heart because you know from say noon to five she would go into the other room and sleep and I'm just out there you know in the living room by myself thinking like oh this rabbit doesn't like me and it you know it would like break my heart every day and then um, my other friend that has a rabbit told me, no, actually they're, you know, that's, it's not that the rabbit doesn't like you. It's that's the period of time where they normally sleep. And now it's like clockwork. It's like in the morning, she's waiting for me at the door to get up and I hang out with her. And then noon to five, she goes and just like passed out, flopped on the side for five hours and then five o'clock until 10, 11 PM, she's up and about and having a great time. So it's like exactly how you explained is, is what her schedule is. That's great. So the, the, the pandemic has been really tough on most businesses. Um, has it affected Ottawa rabbit rescue at all? And if so, are there any things that you, you had to do to adapt? Like maybe, maybe at first where people didn't know what, what the, what COVID was and they thought they would just die if they go outside, maybe people stopped adopting or showing up to, to help out. Did, did that affect you at all? It did. Um, so we were still quite a new rescue when, when COVID-19, uh, occurred. Um, so, you know, we were small enough that, you know, I don't think it took a lot of changes for us to adapt because, you know, we weren't this massive organization that, you know, had so many things on the go. Um, but certainly in terms of fundraising, it impacted us. Um, you know, a lot of rescues, whether it's rabbits or dogs or cats, rely on those uh, in-person fundraisers to be able to connect with the community. So, you know, being able to go to your local pet store and offering uh, a nail trim event or, or even doing like a, a paint night at a local restaurant or bar to raise funds. All of those kind of options for us um, to even look into for, for future um, fundraising uh, were, were eliminated and we were left to, to figure out how to capture an audience online only. Um, I think in terms of 
people being willing to adopt or foster, a lot of people uh, were actually more willing to be able to donate their time because all of a sudden they found themselves at home more often, which, you know, for fostering or volunteering is, is great. Um, for adoption, it is something we were cautious about. Um, you know, certainly there are people that, that now work from home who may eventually have to go back to the office that are still fantastic um, potential adopters. Um, but what a lot of people kind of don't think about is they have all this time now, they want, um, you know, this companionship at home because they are home alone a lot during the day and they think it would be great to bring an animal into the home. Um, but what's important to think about is what about in the future? Um, you know, are you going back to work? Will you be going back to the office or needing to, you know, travel extensively again? Um, so all of those things need to be kind of considered. Um, but I definitely think, you know, if you were to to say what affected us the most uh, from COVID would be our fundraising capabilities. Mm. So speaking of fundraising, when we met up for coffee, you shared the story of someone you know um, that that took action and they started secondhand stories. Um, yes. Can you share? So if people want to go to secondhandstories.ca to check this out, um, can you can you share about that person and their story and what what this is and how they've they've done some good for the cause? Absolutely. So uh, Liz Wheeler has started Secondhand Stories, and I came to know her um, through her applying to be a foster volunteer with Ottawa Rabbit Rescue. Um, she has done amazing things for some of the rabbits that she had fostered for us, um, you know, has kind of brought some of them almost a 180 with being so shy to being, you know, so confident and, and outgoing rabbits that are now ready for adoption. Um, she has always been very active in, in the uh, animal rescue community, as well as just, um, you know, with uh, different humanitarian um, efforts as well. Um, and uh, that was something that she she started uh, kind of, again, on her own accord, um, wanted to to make a nonprofit organization to, to help animals. And that is uh, something that she's dedicated her life to. Um, so she created Secondhand Stories um, where uh, she will accept any and all uh, used uh, books in, in good condition. Um, and sells them for five dollars and the profits from all of these books she doesn't take a cent for herself um, goes to um, a, a rescue uh, that's very near and dear to her which is called the sweet sanctuary and um, they are a rescue that uh, provides sanctuary for for farm animals um, so she in the last year has raised I believe her number is over ten thousand um, dollars for for those animals and for the the care that they require and for you know the maintenance that that a farm um, requires as well to to um, be able to to care for those animals and she is just a such a fantastic person that I'm really glad that um, you know you brought that up today and and I hope that people that are, are listening will will take a, a, a moment to uh, check out her her mission as well because that is um you know, another one that's definitely well worth looking into and is maybe the, the next place that you can just uh, get your next read from. So that's secondhandstories.ca, I believe on uh, Instagram, it's just at secondhand stories. Um, because you brought that up to me, um, I, I went on Instagram and I follow them and I messaged Liz and said, hey, um, are you accepting books. Can I drop off books? She gave me a few, if you're in Ottawa, she has three different locations spread across the city. Um, so a couple of days ago, I dropped off a big uh, box of books that my friend that has a rabbit um, that she donated. Um, so we, we just dropped off some books and, and maybe we can get Liz on the podcast as well to, uh, to raise some awareness for, for secondhandstories.ca. And those books are amazing. Like it's bestseller books. They're in mint condition. They're only $5. So uh, for Christmas, you guys should go to secondhandstories.ca, buy a bunch of books and, uh, and, and help out the cause. So this is this is going to be a different different topic a little bit, but um, rabbits have a few 
kind of strange and unique litter things. So you don't even know what, what, what I'm about to ask, but, um, so I've heard that rabbits don't just have an urge to, to poo. They don't just poo. It's when they eat hay, it's like a process of like the hay comes in, the poo comes out. Like it's like a natural thing that occurs. Is there any truth to that or am I making it up? And then the other thing that's strange is if you see a rabbit eating its own poo, you shouldn't be alarmed. And there's a good reason for that. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Um, so yes. <laughs> this is, is the strangest <laughs> question of the podcast, but I had to ask in case a new owner's like, what is going on here? Right. Uh, so there is truth to both of those. Um, rabbits very much uh, do uh, kind of go to the washroom in the area that they eat, and they do have a very fast metabolism and digestive system. So things kind of move through them quickly as well. Um, so uh, generally speaking, rabbits can be litter trained just like a cat. Um, you know, they they can go there and and not have any accidents on the floor and kind of the easiest way to facilitate that is to have their main source of food, which generally is hay um, in their litter box area. Um, so it's just kind of uh, naturally helps them along with that training process. Um, you know, I do think that they, they have a, a little bit of an ability to, to be able to kind of control um, those urges just based on the fact that they, they can become um, to get to the point where they don't have any accidents outside of the litter box. Um, but generally speaking, yes, that, that does happen at the time they're eating. Um, and again, um, yes, if you see um, a rabbit eating its own poop, that is normal. Um, so because rabbits eat hay and, and things that are, that are um, uh, really uh, dense in fiber and hard to break down, um, it's actually kind of a way for them to get the most nutrients out of the food they're eating. So the first time um, the food passes through their system. It's actually um, a different type of poop uh, called a cecotrope, which is softer. And they eat that again to kind of get the nutrients um, out of the, the waste that they passed um, that otherwise, you know, they wouldn't get and kind of get the most out of what they're eating. Um, and so the poop that you see, you know, maybe left in the litter box or a stray, you know, left on the floor by accident is actually the second time it's passed through their system. And that is once they've gotten as much as possible out of the food they've eaten. So basically it's like they process 50% of the food the first time and then the other 50% to get it all. And um, I've heard it thought of as basically the first time it goes through those pellets that come out, they're producing like their own little vitamins or something. Exactly. Or, you know, you could think of it as um, cows, they, you know, they chew their cud, so they bring their food back up to chew it again a second time. Um, so it's, it's kind of very similar concept to that. So we've, for about an hour and a half now, we've covered like everything rabbits. Like this is super in depth. Um, hopefully people are learning a lot here about rabbits. Um, is, is there anything else that we didn't cover? Is there anything that, that, you know, maybe we didn't cover over the last hour and a half that you'd like to mention or you want to share or did we pretty much uh, deep dive as, as much as we can? I think we have definitely done a pretty good crash course on, on rabbits. This is the beginner's um, guide to adopt it is. fostering. <laughs> yes. And I, I honestly uh, don't have anything else that I think, you know, we, we really kind of skipped over. Um, what I would say is, you know, for anyone that is just wanting to learn more or educate themselves about rabbit ownership, um, we of course can be a resource, you know, even if you're not looking to adopt a rabbit from us right now, um, or if you already own your own rabbits and you just have questions about husbandry um, or, you know, uh, what veterinary clinics we'd recommend, things like that, we are always open to, to receiving those questions um, and, and helping out and um, being part of the rabbit community in that way. Um, and you've mentioned that you've done it yourself, but honestly, YouTube is, um, 
a wealth of information for, for rabbit ownership, as well as just, you know, uh, fun, different things that you can do. You can learn how to make your own toys um, for your rabbit um, or, uh, you know, different puzzles or games you could try with them. So um, there's hours of, of knowledge and info on there as well that um, I still, you know, look up, of course, and, and uh, try to, to learn new things as well. So if we've inspired our listeners, they want to help out, whether a donation, whether fundraising, whether they want to volunteer their time, if they want to drive, if they're looking to adopt or to foster, uh, again, social media, Instagram, Facebook is um, at Ottawa Rabbit Rescue. And then the email is ottawarabbitrescue at gmail.com. Yes. And people, if they just want to reach out to you if they just want to follow what you're up to that's where they go exactly yes and you know one thing I, I always do say is um, you know because we are a volunteer based and and it is uh, just me a lot of the time if I take a day or two to to get back to you um, I do apologize but I, I do appreciate um, each and every uh, question and email or application that's that's sent our way and I do um, try to work through those as, as quickly as possible but it does uh, sometimes take a day or two Amazing. So Megan, as we wrap up, I want to take a second to acknowledge you for all the hard work that you've done, all the good you've done for, for rabbits and for, for, you know, the, the, the scene in Ottawa and, you know, without you, I wouldn't have Violet. Violet, you know, I've had her for, for six weeks and uh, she's been a great source of, of joy and happiness. And I'm glad that I can provide a forever home for her. Um, so thank you for what you do. You're, you're making a difference. And, uh, you know, we could use more people like you in the world. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you for, you know, the last hour and 20 minutes, hour and 30 minutes of uh, sharing your expertise and your knowledge with, uh, with our listeners. Thank you. And, and thank you for having me. And um, thank you for, for giving Violet a, a forever home. It is one of my greatest joys is to watch these rabbits, um, you know, find their forever family. And uh, Violet definitely uh, hit the jackpot with you. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. All right. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you on the next episode. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'd love to hear from you guys. My goal is to grow this podcast organically where you're giving me feedback on topics you'd like me to cover and guests you'd like me to interview. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Joelle Martin Mastery. Joelle is J-O-E-L and on Twitter at Joelle Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message and I'll see you on the next episode.